Hello everybody. I know I'm here, but am I there as well? Do you see me? If one of you fine folks would just give me a thumbs up to know that you're hearing. Arlen, welcome from down the street. Let me see. I am going to assume that you guys can hear me, right? This is a... Okay, good. Excellent. Uh, so, you're hearing everything I'm saying and you can see a picture of me. That's a good start. And we have enough bandwidth, I think, to uh, forge ahead. Um, before we get started today, uh, there are um, four questions that were left over from uh, last week. And uh, I'm going to hit those really quickly um, so that we can be caught up. I can't remember who asked all of them, mind you. One of them was, uh, what is the difference between depth of field and depth of focus? This comes up quite a bit. Uh, depth, of, depth of field is what we talk about when we're measuring the ability of a camera to focus when the camera or the lens actually is fixed and the subject is moving. How far can the subject move and remain in focus is your depth of focus, is your uh, depth of field. Depth of focus refers to a fixed subject where the camera is moving and it refers to the ability to remain in focus when you move the plane of the sensor. So they're two different concepts, and that's a simplification of them. But that's it. Uh, uh, depth of uh, focus and depth of um, field, uh, we, use them, uh, we use them interchangeably, but you shouldn't. Depth of field is the one that we mostly talk about. Okay, I was asked, how do you make the reversed cone hood for a microscope objective? And I really want to show you this because I've been asked about 15 times in the last week. This is only something you need to do when you're using an objective like this, the, the 20 times objective. If you're using a, a 5 or even a 10 times objective, there's really little point in adding this kind of uh, hood. The hood basically cuts out all of the off-axis light that is coming in from the sides. And the reason I, I just recommend this for, for the very uh, high, the high magnification objectives is because their numeric aperture is so big. Uh, this one has a numeric aperture of 0 0.41, which means it has a very large angle that's collecting light. Uh, and that's typical of the longer, uh, of the higher magnification objectives. So this idea, which is Rick's idea, Rick came up with this uh, and got me started on it, uh, is the, um, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I put on the camera I just spent four hours setting up? <laughs> so maybe that'll help. So um, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the thing there. And this is a, a new version of it that uh, I came up with just the other day and it works like a charm. So let me show you how you uh, make one. You take a piece of PVC pipe. Now this is called one inch PVC pipe. It's not one inch, nothing about it is an inch. If you cut a piece an inch long, it would be an inch, but the inside diameter is an inch and a quarter and the outside's an inch and a half. So don't ask me how they do that. This is not the right size, but it has the right features for me to show you what you need to do. See that thing on the inside, that uh, ridge type thing? All right, you need to get a piece that's like this, only in the one inch size. And what you're gonna do is you're going to cut it about half an inch from the, from the ridge in the middle and right below the ridge in the middle with a saw or a, anything you've got that will cut. The end result is you have a, a ring about this big with a ridge at the bottom of it. Then you're gonna take one of these and I'll put links underneath this uh, recording. You'll take one of these little plastic funnels 
These were sent to me by Bud Perrett as part of an insect collecting um, uh, invention of his. But they've got a nice flange on the top and they're the perfect size. If you cut the stem of it off right there, put some super glue around the top, drop it through the hole, it'll just seat perfectly like that, right in, right in there sitting on the groove and that flange will stick to the bottom. Then take it outside um, uh, unless you live alone like I do and just take it into the dining room and spray paint it with matte black paint inside and out. Uh, and this is where you need the chopstick. Get a chopstick and stick it on the chopstick to keep the end from getting paint down in it. Uh, I mean the paint's going to get in it but you don't want the hole to get any smaller. The chopstick will hold it up off the ground. There's one other thing you do when you're finished. Take a little piece of felt I recently discovered this stuff. It is the best, the blackest uh, material I've ever found. A strip of that, the, about as wide as your pipe is uh, long, and lay it in there with the adhesive and it'll just stick. If you don't do that, it won't fit tight. But when you do do that, the thing slides on and it slides all the way to the end of the objective, right where it needs to be to give you a 20 millimeter working distance to the end of the objective and then you just position your subject right in front of that hole and if it doesn't make a difference for you i think you probably did something wrong it's been a huge huge benefit for 20x photography for me and i would give it a try it'll cost you uh, i added it up two dollars to make one but you have to make 12 because that's the, the fewest funnels you can buy all right, if that doesn't work for you, let me know and uh, I'll refund your money. Uh, let me see, where were we? We've got a couple more questions. The setup for the 4X um, uh, microscope objective, the finite objective that I used to use all the time uh, and have talked about many times. There's loads of videos on this, but I'll tell you again. It's a finite objective, which means it forms an image at the tube length on your sensor. Now the tube length is stamped on the objective and it's 160 millimeters for this particular objective if you're getting the Amscope 4X that we talk about. To set it up, all you have, you don't need a tube lens, you don't need any other lens, you just need an, a, an extent, uh, an extent, an extent of tube that will, when added to your flange focal distance, which you can look up online, it will give you 150 millimeters from the rear end of the objective, the, the, the first visible element at the back of the objective, the first piece of glass, all the way to your sensor needs to be 150. The 160 refers to the mechanical tube length and that's when the image is formed at the, at the beginning of the eyepiece, but you don't have an eyepiece. We, don't, we aren't using them, so your image is going to form on the sensor at 150 millimeters. That's all you have to do. You need an adapter so that your objective will screw into an RMS screw for whatever size extension tubes you're using, and that's all you have to do. Put the adapter on, screw the 4X into it, and you're good to go. You cannot be changing the distance because when you change the distance the image will form in front or behind the sensor and your image will get blurred so go to some trouble to measure 150 millimeters that's all you have to do and you're good to go i was asked what my uh, uh, favorite enlarger lenses were and that's i'm, I'm a bit gun shy about starting to answer this question because that's when all hell broke loose last time and my um my uh, computer broke down or my internet but i'm gonna I'll, I'll run through it there's really only four i only own two of them uh the the first and foremost for me is of course the uh el nickel um 50 millimeter f 2.8 n um i think that's the the best enlarger lens out there for the money it's it's fantastic um also in my list though it would be number four would be this, which is the uh, same lens, only a few years earlier. It doesn't have an N on the end, is the only difference. Optically, it's the same lens. 
It's a 50 millimeter f2.8 enlarger lens. It's identical glass. The only difference is this lacks some of the coatings that are on the newer lens. Now, I still think this is a fantastic lens and if you use it carefully and you avoid situations where it'll get glare in there, it'll work. The other two are not really very practical for, for most folks. It's the, the Schneider, the Companon S, 50mm uh, f2.8 enlarger lens, which is a glorious lens, just really expensive, uh, hundreds of dollars, maybe as much as 500 Does anybody have one? Um, they, they had them at um, uh, Adorama when I looked the other day. Um, but they're, uh, they're they're awfully expensive. The other is the uh, Rodagon, the the Roden stock. Uh, they make an APO in larger lens, also 50 uh, 2.8, uh, which is 50 that is 0 0.0 2.8 um, uh, f 2.8. That's a lovely lens too, but I think that's 800 dollars. I think I probably got those the wrong way around. The Schneider's the 800 dollar one, and this is a little bit cheaper, but when you consider that you can get a good used um, EL Nickel for what 50 bucks, 100 bucks these days, maybe there's no, there's just no competition. Anything with APO on it's going to cost you a fortune. They are glorious lenses and they do a great job. I, I have only ever borrowed them, I've never actually owned one. All right, I think that is everything. Um, yes, that's everything that I had to get caught up on. No, it's not. There was one other question. This one actually was a question that came in the mail. I accidentally uh, opened an email this morning that had a question in it, so I felt obligated to, to answer it. The question was this. I have a uh, Elnicor um, 50 f2.8, not an N. I have the old one. This is what the guy said. And I don't like the pictures at 2 to 1. The 2 to 1 images are not good. Would it be okay for me to, to use my 5X objective, uh, Mitutoyo, use it at a different focal length tube lens and make that into a 2.5X objective? Yes, you could do that, but it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to me. Uh, first of all, I would be concerned that maybe you're not using this completely right or maybe it's damaged I, I don't I don't know maybe you've got fungus growing in it but that lens should give you sharp pictures there are much better ways to get to 2x than to buy a $500 objective and a $200 relay lens and all the tubes and bellows and everything else that you'd need to get to 2x you can do it for 50 bucks with the EL Nikkor f 2.8 n so yes you can do it by using a hundred millimeter relay lens uh, with your 5x and it will be it will be optically great but it just seems like an awfully uh, expensive and convoluted way to do it just my opinion uh, all right now I do believe we are caught up so let me see what I've been missing um, my uh, uh, upload speed is still only 2,000 kilobytes per second. That's uh, two and a half megabytes per second. But when I checked it um, at the beginning, I did a speed test. It was, what was it? 67 megabytes per second. I don't know what happens to the other 60. But anyway, I've got three and that's more than enough apparently for a clear picture. Hi, Mike, Luke. David, Luke Baggins, you're back from Mordor. I'm so glad to hear it. Walter, I'm following your instructions, man. I'm following your instructions. Alan, good to see you or not see you from Rogersville. Bruce, good day. Can man from Alberta. Greetings. Alan, down the road. That was me waving to you. Uh, Steve, Alan, Stephen, Stephen. I'll be damned. How are you doing? It's been a long time. Paul Marion from uh, Tasmania. Good grief. I don't think we have uh, many Tasmanians uh, uh, coming along these days. Excellent. Uh, Taduce from uh, Montreal. Uh, did you get the PB6 doc? What's the PB6 doc? 
No, I'm guessing is the answer. Um, was this something I said I'd do? Yeah, leave me a message and tell me. All right. Good, good, good. I'm looking for questions here. Joe, uh, yes, I just answered your question. You don't have the Compan on, but you have a Lights Photar 50 f2.8. Never used it. Heard about it, never used it. Um, is it good? It, it, it must be if you have it. Um, 50 millimeter uh, Nikon f2.8. Brilliant. Agreed. Jan, welcome. Greetings in Michigan. What width of Yandu black felt tape did you order? I ordered this, this thickness. The same thickness as my head, apparently. No, it's, I think it's three inches or four inches. It's one of those two, three or four inches. It is three inches wide, but I plan to be using it, cutting it this way. Hang on, this way, and laying the strips in. Uh, and it's nifty that you can pull it out without taking the wrapping off, but it is really black. It's like that paint that you've got, Mike, that, uh, that paint where everything disappears when you paint it. Um, okay, where was I? I'm going to go to the bottom. So there's a lot of people voting for the Fotar, it seems. I've not, I, I, I've not seen the lens of late. All right. Greg Wilson, welcome from California. Jules, good to have you. Aloha from Honolulu. That's, that's not Greg, is it? I don't think so. All right, I think I'm all caught up and I'm looking for questions. Rick, you're in Switzerland? I'll be damned. You talk about 151 proof. Can you leave an insect in solution till ready or is there working time? I don't use 151. I use uh, actually, I guess it's... Uh, uh, 200 proof 195 proof it's it's almost pure ethanol and um, uh, no th there really isn't I mean if you can photograph a, uh, an insect fresh you can photograph it after five minutes in alcohol or five months in alcohol um, it it does tend to uh, denature the proteins and it stiffens the insect up a little bit makes it a bit easier to handle after it's been in there a while, but no, there, there's no specific time. Um, is it worth me buying an actual relay lens for the 20X instead of a Raynox? Look, that is that is a, 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 a very good question that I think a lot of people would, would like to know the answer to. I have both, and I use only the ITL 200. I think it is a better lens from corner to corner, but I use a crop frame camera. If I was using a full frame camera, I'd probably use the DCR 150 more than I do. Uh, but if you're, do, if you're using a, a, a crop frame camera, I would say you're probably gonna be happier with the ITL 200. But if, you're, if you've got a full frame camera, you'll probably be happier with the Raynox. Uh, uh, with the Raynox. Just my opinion. Newbie to focus stacking, Xerine or Helicon? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> no, this, this, is, uh, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Yeah, it's Xerine. Uh, it's, it's always going to be Xerine because Xerine is a full-featured focus stacking program. It does everything. It, um, uh, it has all of the retouching tools that you need to advance as far as you can take your focus stacking. Now, lots and lots of people use Helicon um, because it is quick and it's easy, but it doesn't give you the, as much flexibility and it doesn't, in my opinion, allow you to get as far with your macro as you can with Xerine. Xerine is no more expensive and uh, it doesn't really 
take any longer to, to learn how to use it. And if you learn how to use it properly, um, and I have got probably a dozen videos on it now, uh, but if you learn how to use all the features in it, you will never regret having it because it, it, it simply is a better stacking program. Um, people ask me, have, have asked me in the last year quite a bit, well, you would say that you're a friend of Rick's. Um, well, I am. I am a friend of Rick, but I'm a friend of Rick because we met through uh, Xerine. I mean, I use the thing uh, every day, all day long, and, and that's how I met him when it, it broke down and I called him and he helped me fix it. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not the other way around. I don't use uh, Xerine because my friend invented it. Um, so there you go. Definitely, definitely Xerine. Um, and if you ever have a problem with Xerine, j and just ask Bill this. Bill, if you're out there, you can speak up on, on behalf of yourself for this one. But if you have a problem with it, you call the, the help number and Rick answers the phone. And he walks you through the solution. So, yeah, that's not going to happen with uh, Helicon. All right. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the other part of the question, Helicon Lite or Pro version is kind of immaterial because that's the, that's the, wrong, that's the wrong program. Uh, if you want to know more about it, I did a four-video series on um, a comparison between the two. I did a, a Helicon or Xerine and with photographs and everything. I did the whole nine yards and there's articles on my website that, that explain it. Okay. So, yes, Luke, Luke, I thought it was you. Uh, the same Luke. There you go. And uh, let me see, where are we? Which edition of Xerine is needed? Okay. It, you want to get, first of all, they, they, they do have a, a full-featured um, trial version that gives you everything that you would get if you bought it. And you don't buy the professional version unless you are stacking images and selling them to people for money. Not like me, trying to sell them to people for money, but actually selling them. Then you're a professional and you should buy the professional uh, license. But other than that, you just buy the prosumer license, which is exactly the same as the license for um, uh, uh, Helicon. Only when you buy Xerine, it's for life and uh, you'll always have it. So there you go. Did I post the full Chris Field interview? Yes. And when you went back to watch the rest of it, you could swear it had disappeared. Well, it did disappear. And it still disappeared probably until the end of this uh, live stream. Let me tell you what happened. The interview went great. Uh, I, we did it beforehand because of the whole issue with the, uh, the internet conking out on me. And... Um, uh, it was great. The interview went fantastic, and, and I got it all edited in time. And at the last minute, when, when I was going back through it the last time, and we got to the bit about Drone Seed, this company that plants forests where fires have ravaged them, um, it occurred to me, you know what? Uh, I, I ought to see if there's any footage of these, of these uh, dining room table size uh, uh, drones planting trees. And there was. And I uh, uh, stripped just a little bit of video from, uh, from their promo uh, material and then uh, immediately wrote to the company and said, hey, this is a last minute thing, but can I use these clips uh, in a video featuring the guy that's doing your photography and uh, it's all on the up and up? And uh, the CEO called me back and said, Yes, you can. If it's on the website, you can use it. And um, I was thrilled because I thought it added a lot to the, to the video to be able to drop those clips in. So I did, and it was released, and a lot of people watched it. And then um, today, I'm not good with my email. I can't, can't get it all uh, caught up. I'm like 5,000 behind. But what caught my eye was another email from the CEO who said, I've changed my mind. Uh, you can you can have all of it in there except that last little bit, that last two seconds. 
so I went uh, online on YouTube. I took the took the video down. I clipped the last little bit off and a few words, and uh, and and that was it. And now it's waiting for YouTube to do its thing. It's been a day and a half. As soon as they fix it, as soon as they say, "Yep, yeah, the edit's done," I will put it back on there. So, and if you haven't seen it, go see it. Uh, Chris is a remarkable fellow. Everybody who's uh, who's who's watched it has been impressed with the guy. He does great work. Even my son, who doesn't uh, well doesn't really talk to me very much. Um, um, I wonder why. Uh, called me and said, "I just w watched that video of you interviewing your friend Chris, and uh, I'm not too impressed with you, but that that guy's a nice guy. I'd like to meet him. So there you go. You you ought to give it a shot." Uh, let me see. How professional are the Leowa wide-angle macro lenses? You're looking for a landscape 24 to 28 look, but at a macro scale. I'm not exactly sure uh, how, how I would describe the lens, uh, if I would describe the lens as, uh, as a pro lens. It's a macro lens that's that's uh, manual um, focus is uh, is as professional as the glass is good. I, and I I like the lens. Um, it's it's really nice. It takes good pictures, and there really isn't much out there that's like it. Unless you're going to use a wide angle uh, uh, lens in your camera brand and put a tiny extension tube on, it's the only other way you're going to be able to get that. I think for the five hundred dollars. I, I, it's on my list. It's one of the things that. Why don't you buy two of them and uh, send me one, and uh, yeah, and th then I'll I'll try it for a few years, and if I like it, I'll uh, I'll send it back. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're getting into the 4x microscope lens and beyond. Should I use my extension tubes with electrical contacts? Nope, and uh, a helicoid. Uh, or screw tubes with adapter rings, or your cheap bellows. Well, I don't know which cheap bellows you have, uh, but if you're using the 4X, the easiest thing for you to do is use whatever you've got. If you've, if you've got this kind of extension tube that has contacts, use it. It doesn't make any difference. There's nothing electrical in the objective to send a signal to. It doesn't do anything. And all you have is space between the objective and your sensor. So you can use any tube. You could use a length of PVC if you wanted. I prefer to use small M42 extension tubes because they're slick and they're compact. Um, the helicoid, yes. In fact, let's do that properly again one more time because I like doing this, pressing that button. The, the helicoid, uh, is is this device and uh, it fits on the camera and then your extension tubes in this case m42s screw into this end and when you if you do it the right way when you twist the ring you see it gives you more or less extension and this is a wonderful way to fine tune your rig because when you have the extension tubes um, and the the objective at the end and you're using extension tubes that have big, I'm holding the thing up to the wrong camera, excuse me, there. <laughs> when you have big long extension tubes like this, it's very hard to get to fine tune it uh, if you need to tweak it just a little bit. A helicoid's the perfect way to do that. And when you get into um, using actual uh, uh, infinity corrected optics, when you have a lot of different distances you're going to be very specifically concerned about. Yeah, you're, uh, having a helicoid is a good idea. So I, I would get one. This one was dirt cheap. And it was it's from Photosy. There you go. It's so 15 to 26 millimeters. That's the, the extent that it will go out. 26 down to 15. And that's enough. Uh, that's a great length to have because it's in between the sizes that most extension tubes come in. So I like that. Um, yeah, that's uh, that that's definitely a good a good buy. Uh, Luke, your twenty five millimeter five X broke 
after a week of use. Suspected to be a manufacturer's error. Can't get a refund ex or exchange. Huh. Would, would you buy another one or would you switch to the 5X Mitu toy? Well, le listen, I, I, have, I, I have bad mouthed that lens a lot. That and the MPE 65. Because I, I've always believed and I will always believe, I think, that, that you, there is a better way to get to 5X than using a camera lens. Microscope objectives are made to image at 5 and 10 and 20 times magnification. Camera lenses are not. They're made to do the opposite. So, yes, I, I had my hands on this lens for two or three months this summer. And I loved it. It was great fun to use. It was fun in the studio. It was fun in the field. I took some really nice pictures with it. Uh, likewise, my friend Andy Murray, the guy that photographs the soil, um, he uh, uses an MPE 65 on a ridiculous amount of extension and takes the most glorious pictures. So, yeah, it, it's, it, it's not about necessarily what's the best way to get to 5x i personally um well you know what i probably would get that lens now as i think about it because i've already got a 5x objective i don't need to get there twice so yeah i i, I would buy one if i could if i could afford it I'd, I'd have one of those it would be close to uh well it would be halfway down my must-have list but uh, yeah i'm sorry to hear it broke what happened to it there's not much in it that can break was it the focus I'm, I'm suspecting? Let me know anyway. I'd like to know that. Uh, oh, you just got the, uh, Mark just got the Z105. Well, I've seen it. I had my hands on it um, in the uh, cam local camera shop. And um, yeah, they had it on a Z7. The first version of the, V7, the Z7, I think absolutely brilliant lens it's very reminiscent of the of the 105 uh, for the dslrs which is definitely one of my favorite lenses but uh, yeah I'd, I'd love to i'd love to see that lens very very nice um any tips on repositioning appendages of small one to two millimeter insects and posing them in the studio yes Alan, and i do uh, I almost called you last week to ask if I could borrow your internet um, because I was having nightmares about this going wonky again and we're already at half an hour and it hasn't. So uh, you you escaped there. But uh, anyway, I think that the, the best tip I could give you is uh, in the wet phase, that is when your insect is still dripping wet and sticks to paper, Give your uh, uh, give yourself a chance to to spread the appendages or antennae or whatever you're trying to do while the bug is sticking to the paper. You have to be quick. You only have a couple of seconds, so a little spreading action to get the legs out the way you want them. But if that doesn't work, as soon as the thing is dry, and if it's a one to two millimeter bug, it's probably dry by now. Since I've been talking about it, it'd be bone dry by now. Stop what you're doing and stop fidgeting around with it when it's dry because it's just going to scoot all over the table and instead uh, glue it or, or pin it however you're going to pin it. At two millimeters you're going to glue it. So position a pin, bend a curve in it so that it hugs the, the abdomen of the bug or whatever way you decide to pin it so that it is really stable and use so little glue that you can't tell there's glue on the pin and it'll stick and it'll hold beautifully. Then you can reposition the limbs with puffs of air from a lens cleaner. That's what I would do. If that doesn't do it, use the tip of a, of a triangle of filter paper or twist it up kitchen paper to a point to gently tease the legs out while you're holding the pin. That's a short answer to a really long question, but uh, that, that's what I do, and it, work, it works for me. Do I drink 191 proof? Yes, that's all I drink. It's, it's, um, uh, it's all I drink. I used to drink a lot of water as well, and it was just um, not strong enough for me. 
Uh, I've said before why you use, hang on, I have said before why I use the APS-C camera for studio macro, but you've forgotten. Oh, Bruce, memory problems, eh? <laughs> the, the reason is quite simple. I cannot uh, keep up with the data when I use the full frame camera and almost Everything else I do uh, in this job requires that full frame camera, whether I'm taking pictures, uh, product photographs uh, or shooting video. That's my video camera, the D850 with a 2470 on it. It's always, always, always doing something. Except now, for some reason, it's just sitting here like that. But that's that is my... Um, the, the, the reason I don't use this on the rail is because it's it's my movie, it's my video, video camera, and I love it for that. So uh, even if I had another full frame camera right now, which I don't, uh, I still probably wouldn't use it on the rail uh, unless it was a, an older one, maybe a 24 megapixel camera. And the reason is uh, I do a lot of three and four hundred uh, image stacks uh, a day, eight, maybe sometimes as many as ten a day, every day. And um, yeah, that's a lot of hard drives uh, you go through doing that. So this uses about half as much data and it makes it easier for me. I can get a little bit behind on cleaning out my, my uh, uh, stored up photographs before my computer crashes, but I fa found when I was using the D850, I couldn't uh, I couldn't work for a week without crashing the computer because of the volume of data, and I can't I don't think my computer <laughs> will take any more eight terabyte uh, hard drives. I was telling um, uh, Chris, uh, who uses even more data than I do, Chris Field, uh, in our interview that uh, when I have all these things grinding away on my desk it actually heats this end of the house <laughs> so yeah that's why I, I don't do it i i much prefer the pictures and when uh, when i have something that i know is going to be special like that b when i shot that b uh, i was so blown away by how beautiful that thing was I thought, oh, that, that's going to be an exception to the rule. And I, I broke everything down and put the 850 on there and, and, and shot a bunch of pictures of that B with it. So, yeah, I will for the really important stuff. But um, for the, every day, it's just the D7500. By the way, this is the D7500 with a kit lens on it that is uh, recording the... the uh, work surface there i i think it's a, a pretty decent picture um so that's good maybe i'll start doing some video with that and free up my camera to do other stuff but uh, i'm just musing now okay right i agree that that is a shame about uh, uh about them not not doing anything to, to fix it i mean if if it's in if it's in warranty but then again we know how that works so uh a trivial aside not not a question nikon say the 50 2.8 is designed for peak performance at 8x and nikon considers the operational range to be 2x to 20x as an enlarger lens yeah uh, and I, you know, I, I'm not sure I agree. I, I would say peak performance is probably uh, four times magnification, which is where I use it the most. But there's more to it than just its resolution and its sharpness. It is it also the flattest lens I've ever used. It, it doesn't have any aberration in the geometry. It's a lovely lens. So the lens barrel snapped <coughs> on the 25 how does that happen? You must have thrown it at a wall. The whole lens sags. And, and it rattles. Okay, th that sounds like um, it's broken. <laughs> Lenses shouldn't rattle or sag. 
Oh, that's that's awful. You know, um, there is a shop. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I will, though, in a minute. Uh, here, where I live, or it's actually in the next state over in Florida, but just half an hour from here. Uh, lovely camera shop, and they have a really good lens guy in there. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if that guy couldn't take your lens apart and fix it for you. I would, uh, I would at least ask them. Um, Arlen, what's the name of that place? Um, there's one also in Mobile. I can't remember the name of it. Fat family-owned place, probably out of business now. Uh, but Luke wants to get to five X. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. It's, you know, something. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, branch off here for just a second. People have a, a way of thinking about magnification that is very misleading. Um, it's uh, And it's something that I think affects all of us when we first get into high magnification macro. And by that, I mean more than one to one. There is a tendency to look at something, uh, an ant, and think, well, yeah, five to one, That's that, it's a tiny ant. It's still going to be tiny if it's five times that size. Um, but we lose sight of the fact that, that we're, we're actually not thinking about the right thing. The, the, the five times uh, in, uh, enlargement is actually happening on the sensor. And that very quickly fills the very limited space that you have. So we have a tendency to way, way, way overestimate how much magnification we need for a given photograph. And it also you need to bear in mind the fact that on a, a crop frame camera, you've only got 24 millimeters of width to use up. And if you have a, a, a little beetle that's a, a centimeter long, five times that is twice the width of your sensor. So it, it's good to think about the actual numbers, the, the, the things you're going to photograph. How big is that thing going to be at 5x and how much room is it going to leave on your sensor? So you, you would have to have a very a two millimeter, and that is a small bug, two millimeters. A two millimeter bug at 5x is going to, to give you 10 millimeters of bug on a 24 millimeter field so you've got plenty of room for context and composition and all that but it does help to think about it before you spend a lot of money on an objective that you might never use it's 10x that gets people uh, they'll buy a, a 10x objective and then realize they, they don't have anything that small to photograph <laughs> and you know they don't want to go find things that you can't see so that that's just something i wanted to mention all right So, I'm just reading what's going on with this disaster of a lens situation. Well, I'll, I'll catch up on that later. I'm going to look for another question. Oh, it was while you were turning the magnification ring. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know how they're, they're made. I would like to take one apart, though. All right. Well, just chat amongst yourselves, guys. Calagaz, well done. Who, who said that? D Stone said that. That's right. Calagaz Photo. They have one in uh, Pensacola, uh, Florida and one in Mobile, Alabama. Owned by a family, do uh, great print work, um, have a good selection of used gear at both places, but the the used gear at um, the Pensacola shop is absolutely fantastic. And I make a pilgrimage over there um, every uh, every now and again uh, to, to go through their bins. They have these, they, they buy um, uh, estate, lots of camera equipment when businesses go out of business or or um, uh, you know people who collect stuff pass away whatever they buy it 
and then they sort through it and they put the stuff they the, they like the cameras and the expensive stuff in one bucket to sell and then they put the rest in this these many boxes they have in the back and they let me have a look through them every now and again and I have found the best stuff bits of really right stuff equipment that they don't even know what it's for what it goes to I found a keep on um, tilt shift adapter for my Nikon camera in that in one of those bins for they let me have it for five bucks it was a five hundred dollar adapter so yeah it's um it's great it's great great place I'd love I love to go over there but I bet their lens guy could fix your lens at a reasonable price have I ever found an insect that has never been identified yes all the time I mean because I'm the one identifying it I I uh, I uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time tracking down an ID on an insect I don't recognize um, because I'm not an entomologist. Uh, I'm a photographer who likes insects, but I I, I don't collect them and I, I don't really keep a, a log of what I what I catch. I do like to name them, but I can usually get the genus without any problem. Now. When I just have to know the name of something, uh, the first place I go is the bug guide, uh, bug net, I think it's called, bug net guide. The second thing I do is call Rick, uh, because Rick will probably know what it is just off the top of his head. And he'll argue with me if he thinks I'm wrong. I sent him a picture of a, gosh, what was it? Oh, a, a, a very interesting nectar drinking fly that I was photographing. And, um, yeah, I named it, and he told me I was wrong. <laughs> if that wasn't the one it was. So there you go. It's good to have, um, it's good to have friends who know this stuff. Um, but, no, I've never had one that I sent to somebody else to identify, and they just couldn't figure it out, because then it would, be, would have my name on it, wouldn't it? I'd have discovered it. But, no, never happened. Uh... Let me see. Do I use higher mag to look at small aspects of subjects? Absolutely. Most of the time I do that. Now, my, my specialty or my favorite is a better word. My favorite thing to photograph are the really, really small but really, really common things. Uh, most of this stuff up here is really small and really common. No, not the top thing. That's a building. That's really big and really common. But the, the really small insects are fun because they're unusual. They're, they, they look, uh, in, in many cases, they look very exotic because you're not used to seeing them in color, full size on a print. So that's my, my favorite thing to do. So everything is unusual when you're working at that very, very small scale. But... Most of the time, and most of the time when I'm teaching, people are using objectives like the, the, the 20X to look at interesting features on common bugs or, or uncommon bugs that they order from a, a, an insect supply house. Uh, you, you may want to know more about an antenna or a, 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 a grabber at the end of a, an appendage or, um, yeah, reproductive organs. That's a popular one. And... Uh, that's most of what you're going to do with a with a 20x objective because there isn't that much you're going to look at that you that you'll see whole with one of those um and it's difficult too did i have i mentioned that before 20 times photography is is difficult uh, light management is difficult keeping light out of the objective uh, except where you want it is difficult uh, they're hard to focus um they're they're, they're difficult photographs to get and uh, yeah, I've got another video, possibly two, to wrap up the 20X series that will be coming out uh, at some point in the future. Uh, not every image need be a full frame image. Yes, I agree. In fact, I'm something of a minimalist in the, the, the photographs that I most like of my own will often be a subject on a very 
a minimal background, but with enough background to give kind of scope to it. It's a very simple composition, but I love the effect, uh, whether it be a dark background or a light background. I love I love the effect of negative space and it's underused in macro. We have a tendency uh, to, to cram as much as we can into the photograph to show off the, the, the subject, but sometimes less is more. I absolutely agree with you, Bruce. Uh, do you use photo pills for your step size calculator? No, I don't, Walter, but I recommend it to other people. Uh, I think it is a great, uh, they have a they have a um, uh, focus stacking step length calculator and a, a macro calculator. And I do recommend it. The reason I don't use it is I don't use one uh, at all. Um, I just remember my step lengths uh, and have them on a little piece of paper by my um, bellows. Um, but when I do need one, I usually use the one in Xerine just because it's got a few more uh, bells and whistles that you can uh, adjust. But it's um, it, Photo Pills is good. It's definitely one of the ones I recommend. Let me make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh, don't worry about it, Luke. It's, I was gonna say one thing though. Um, the, the, um, the chat thing here is good and I'm glad you're using it. I'm glad you're talking to one another. You can also take this kind of stuff to Discord and uh, this, a lot of the same people will be over there and can can help you sort through questions like this. There's even a room over on Discord made for this kind of discussion. I'm not saying you can't have it here. I'm just saying that, that that's another place that you'll get uh, a lot of feedback from other folks. Um, no, I'm glad you're, you're, you're talking here. I, I think if we get a whole lot busier, I'll want you to start putting a some kind of a capital Q or something. No, that won't help. Some some way of uh, notifying me that it's a question so I, uh, I can be more efficient. But yeah, it's good. Uh, has the question of depth of focus and depth of field been answered? Uh, it has, but it's worth mentioning again, I think, because it's an interesting concept. When we talk about depth of field, which is what we usually talk about, we're talking about the, um, the, the focusability of our lens when the subject is moving. Now, not when the subject is in motion, but we are moving the subject to determine where the near and far points of focus are. That's what we talk about when we're talking about depth of field. When we talk about depth of focus, we're talking about a subject that is fixed in space and a camera that is moving and not just nearer and further but also moving at different angles so that the angle of the sensor to the subject is changing how does that affect the amount of uh, uh, range of focus that you have so that that's the difference there's more to it than that they're actually optical terms that, that have a very specific meaning but that is a, a very handy uh, way of thinking about it that i've always taught is the you know depth of uh, depth of field is the, the the subject is is moving and we're trying to figure out how much focus that we can be uh, that we can have and then depth of focus is the camera moving in a fixed uh, object it's it's a little bit complicated but don't worry about it you're doing good uh thoughts on dark field and uh, epi illumination no none uh i have done precious little since i left university with with dark field and um yeah i, I mean I, I read about it looks like a lot of fun don't have the equipment so um yeah uh, if if you do maybe that's something we should uh, we should talk about offline because i'd love to to um, learn something new always uh, can you explain how to set up an insect to photograph using a stacking rail should it be a certain angle to the camera um well, that's a, that is a really good question. No, it, 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 it's, it is no different than taking a picture of your girlfriend, um, presumably um, in, yeah, okay. So you would take the picture 
in the way that makes the insect look m the most interesting to you. Um, that That is the only rule. So generally speaking, what I do, because of the way I position my insects, which is on a pin usually with a blob of blue tack at the bottom, which I'm able to move with my fingers to change the angle of the, of the insect, I'll usually put it right on the, the, the little um, shelf that I use to photograph on, a little XYZ table, and I'll stick it in place, and I'll look at it through the, the, the lens system, and I'll look at it just facing me, just straight up and down facing me, and then I will start moving it, and I will look at it with every move, and you will immediately see when you have hit upon an angle that works for that insect. I'm going to point to the same photograph again. This bee tilted slightly to the left and as if it's turning and flying towards you was the absolute way to photograph that bee because everything that I wanted to show suddenly became visible. And that's the trick. Don't, it, I tell people to, to pre-visualize your shot. So when you've, you're looking at it under a magnifying glass to clean it and to put, put it on a pin, move it around and look at it and kind of get a feel for what looks best so that you have an idea when you get into your microscope, I mean, to your uh, rig, you know how to position it to catch that, that, that nice angle. But it's very much your own personal taste. And um, yeah, don't, don't go in with a, a, a preconceived idea either. Just be open to what's beautiful and what's interesting and, and what you want to see. I took a picture... Uh, something unusual happened the other day. I was out netting some insects and I accidentally caught two of the things I usually try to avoid, which are agapostamon bees. They're beautiful, beautiful bees. Oh, there's the picture. That's the picture I'm talking about. You can't see it because of the glare. Now, I didn't, I didn't see whether or not Laura was on tonight, um, but Laura, this is your photograph. I had to take it back out of your package uh, to show tonight because I wanted to have it on the wall. It had a space on the wall. This was the two Agapostamon bees, and seeing as they were both dead, I positioned them in a way I've never done before as, as a pair on the with two pins and they, these are very small bees and i positioned them right close together and started looking at all the different angles and i was amazed at the uh, the awesome compositions i came up with the two fl bees flying towards the lens and then flying past the lens and then this one was them flying away from the lens kind of in formation and the way his he that's a he and that's a she and the way uh, his wing is kind of around her, I just thought was brilliant. Yeah, so that's that's what I mean. That's the 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 whole concept of of, of photographing insects is don't don't go in with with a, a preconceived idea. Put your uh, put your insect up and look at it and see what works. You can do a lot with an insect. All right. Uh, are you ha is everybody happy with this depth of field, depth of focus thing? 20 is difficult. 5 to 10 is better. Yep, it depends what you're photographing. 5 to 10 is great unless you need 20. And uh, it's, good, it's good to know. All right. Hmm. No way to clean an EOS R sensor out in the field. I, I there, there are there are things that you can do to clean your sensor out in the field. I wouldn't recommend them unless you were absolutely in need of of cleaning the sensor and you weren't anywhere uh, to to do it properly. But there are ways you you can do it with a charged piece of cloth if you're very very careful. You can pull most of the, the dust off. Anyway, we won't get into that. Gosh, I don't want to be responsible for anybody putting an oily rag down in their camera to clean it off. 
Uh, let me see. Macro is the most challenging type of photography you've done so far, drone dugs. Yeah, that's why I love it. That's why I do it. In fact, that's not necessarily true. I think all photography is, is really challenging. I mean, none of it's easy to me, but this is really challenging. Um, how do you store pin specimens? Great question, Walter. Nobody's asked me that one ever. I don't uh, store them pinned. Um, I very, very gently remove the pin, uh, and sometimes that means leaving the pin and the bug in alcohol for a day. Uh, and then I remove the, the pin and put the insect in um, uh, alcohol by itself. Bear in mind that um, uh, the um, pinned insect on a pin will discolor if you leave the pin in and you put it in alcohol. Um, and uh, most of the time, if the, if the bug's less than two millimeters, by the time you photograph it, you probably need to throw it away. It's hard to, hard to use them again. That's for big insects, and big insects don't always need glue on them. You can just use a pin. If they're just on a pin, push them off the pin back into the alcohol. The hole in their thorax helps the alcohol get in, I hear, so they say. I'm going to call it quits as soon as I answer... Um, as soon as I answer Bruce's question here, because it is nine o'clock and I am, I've given my solid, uh, my solemn word of honor. I wouldn't run long on this. Um, could you not set your full frame camera to a smaller pixel count? Yes, I could. But the question would be the same. I wouldn't have my big camera to do all the other things I need to do during the day. I'm not kidding. I'm focus stacking from when I get out of bed in the morning till I get back in bed at night. It's always going. So it would tie up a too important a piece of equipment for everything else. But yeah, I, I, I see, I hit, I hear your point. That, that ding noise, did you hear that ding noise? That was the, the shut up, Alan. Your time is up, ding noise. If you have asked... A question that I haven't answered, I will answer it next time. I proved that tonight that I would do that, and um, I also proved that I'd do a demo, even though it wasn't a very good demo. It's enough for you to build it. If anybody has any questions, then um, bring them next week. If anybody asks you a question and you can't answer it, tell them to come here next week, because. If we ever run out of time doing this, I'll do it another time during the week until we get all your questions answered. That's my mission. Got it? Okay, uh, so until the 20th, which is another Tuesday by odd coincidence at 8 o'clock, I will see you later. And uh, if you want to become part of the in crowd, by the way, go over to Patreon and look up my name and, and join us. Uh, for some paltry sum of, of uh, 10 shekels a week, um, you and I could be best friends. Or <laughs> well, okay, so we wouldn't be best friends, but we would be friends, definitely. $10 worth of friends. All right, guys, I'll see you in a week. Take care, stay safe, and be well. Adios. <laughs>